All right, Celebration Online, what is going on? My name is Stephen. We are so glad that you are here. We are excited because this past week we had over 100 people take the next step of baptism here at our campuses in Southeast Louisiana. And I want to let you know, if you haven't taken that next step, you can still do so. We have a great testimony of an individual who even flew in town to one of our campuses to get baptized. If you would want more information about baptism, go ahead and email us at online at celebrationchurch.org. We're about to begin our service with a great time of worshiping through song. I want to encourage you to participate with us wherever you're at. Don't be a spectator. Be a participator. Stand up, clap your hands, sit down, get on your knees. Whatever it is that you want to do to worship the Lord, I want to encourage you to do that as we kick off our service today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you in this way, in this fashion. We thank you so much for the many lives that were transformed last week and the lives who decided to take the next step of baptism. Father, would you transform our lives today as we worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. Spirit sound, rushing wind, fire of God, fall within, Holy Ghost, breathe on us, we pray. As we repent, turn from sin, by the ember smoldering, breath of God, fan us into flame. We need a fresh wind, a fragrance of heaven, for your spirit out, for your spirit out. Hearts that burn with holy fear, purified, faith indeed, refined as fire, strength in what remains. Be the church, and so be the church, and bear your light, lamp of flame, city bright, king and kingdom, come is what. Oh, yeah. 
Well, that is our prayer here at Celebration Online, that God will pour his spirit out on each and every single one of us wherever you're watching the service from. Hey, my name is Pastor Stephen. Thank you so much for being with us. As I mentioned at the beginning of our service today, we had over 100 people take the next step of baptism last week. And I wanna encourage you again, if you haven't taken the step of baptism, let us know. Go ahead and email me online at celebrationchurch.org so I can work with you to find out what's the best way for you to take that next step. But here's what's great about this weekend. It's Life Group Connection Weekend here at Celebration Church. This is the weekend where we wanna encourage you to get connected to a life group. You're about to hear a phenomenal message from Pastor Patrick Egan as we talk about the importance of community and life groups. Before we get into that, I want to let you know that we want to give you an opportunity to give here at Celebration Church, to give back to the Lord how he has so graciously given to you. As always, just want to say thank you to those of you who are doing that and making ministry like this possible so people all around the world can hear the message and ministry of Jesus. Two ways to do that here at Celebration Online. First way, celebrationchurch.org slash give. That's how you can set up reoccurring giving. That's how me and my family do it. Easy way to do that, a couple seconds to set up. Second way is webcc.info. You can access the sermon notes. You can submit a prayer request. You can make a decision. You can also give webcc.info. Now, why don't you go ahead and open webcc.info, access that sermon notes tab as we hear an incredible word from Pastor Patrick. All right, hello and welcome to Celebration Online. We're so glad you tuned in with us here on the interwebs. And here we are continuing our series called The God Who Provides. So far in this series, we've seen that God has delivered the Israelites from their hunger, providing for them. He's delivered them from thirst, from battles, and then they celebrated their victories, which we talked about last week. Now, this week is special because this week we're going to be talking a lot about life groups. Life groups are small groups of believers that meet for fellowship, for discipleship. They meet to minister to others in the name of the Lord. And and so this is a big life group connection time. We want to make it easier than ever to connect to a life group. In life groups, we develop godly relationships. We learn how to apply scripture to our lives. We discover and develop our spiritual gifts. And it allows us to bring the good news of Jesus to our world and to our neighborhood. So if at any point, you decide you'd like to connect to a life group. And we have online life groups. If you decide you'd like to connect to a life group, make sure you visit webcc.info because we've got a tab there where you can register to join a life group. Now today as we continue our series, we're going to see our main character Moses again. He's going to receive some help and in turn help others take their next step in following the Lord. If you have your Bible, I wish you'd turn to Exodus Chapter 18, we're going to be reading verses 13 through 26. In Exodus, chapter 18, verse 13, the Bible says, The next day Moses took his seat to hear the people's disputes against each other. It sounds a little bit like today, doesn't it? They wailed before him from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he asked, What are you really accomplishing here? Why are you trying to do all this alone while everyone stands around you from morning till evening? Moses replied, because the people come to me to get a ruling from God. When the dispute arises, they come to me, and I'm the one who settles the case between quarreling parties. I inform the people of God's decrees and give them his instructions. Well, this is not good, Moses' father-in-law exclaimed. You're, you're going to wear yourself out and the people, too. This job is too heavy a burden for you to handle all by yourself. Now, listen to me, and let me give you a word of advice, and may God be with you. You should continue to be the people's representative before God, bringing their disputes to him. Teach them God's decrees and give them his instructions. Show them how to conduct their lives, but select from all the people some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. Appoint them as leaders over groups of 1,000, 100, 50, and 10. They should always be available to solve the people's common disputes, but have them bring the major cases to you. Let the leaders decide the smaller matters themselves. They will help you carry the load, making the task easier for you. If you follow this advice, and if God commands you to do so, then you will be able to endure the pressures, and all these people will go home in peace. Moses listened to his father-in-law's advice, and followed his suggestions. He chose capable men from all over Israel and appointed them as leaders over the people. He put them in charge of groups of 1,150 
and 10. These men were always available to solve the people's common disputes. They brought the major cases to Moses, but they took care of the smaller matters themselves. Now, Moses... Moses had been used by God in some powerful ways already. He was, used by, he was used by God to bring the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and to overcome destruction at the hands of the Egyptians, leading them through the Red Sea. He led them to find water when they needed water, food when they needed food, but none of this was done by Moses' hands alone. You know, Moses may be the central character in our story, but he's not the hero of our story. The hero of our stories in the Bible are always the Lord. Here we see Moses trying to be the hero. We see him trying to tackle everyone's problems by himself, but the truth is he needed help. Let me ask you, have you ever felt overwhelmed and just needed some help with your life, with your career, with your job, with your family, with your kids, with your relationships, with your finances? There have been so many times where I've just needed some help. I heard a story a long, long time ago. A hurricane, a big storm was coming, and they called an evacuation of the low-lying areas, but there was a man who just wouldn't leave. And they, 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 the governor said, you got to leave, and he wouldn't leave, and he said God would save him. His faith was in the Lord, and the water got high, and a truck came along to evacuate him, but he refused to go. And the water got higher, and a boat came along, but he refused to go. And finally, a helicopter came along while he's on his roof, but he refused to go, and before long, the floodwaters, they overwhelmed him, and when he had died and was in the presence of the Lord, he said, God, I believed in you. I trusted you. I knew you were going to save me. Why didn't you save me? And the Lord said, what do you mean? I sent you a a truck, a boat, and a helicopter. What more do you want? And the reality is that God has sent some things into our lives to help us, and we want to talk about that today. Can I tell you that part of receiving help from the Lord involves receiving the help he has already sent us. If you're here, you're overwhelmed, you're burdened, you're watching, you're stressed out. Can I just tell you, there are already some ways God has sent help to you, and we're going to talk about that today. Let me ask you, what areas of life do you need to receive some help to take the next step in your faith? We're going to talk about that. We'll give you three major things here today. We receive the help we need, number one, by seeking God's direction for our lives. We receive the help we need by, by, receiving, by seeking God's direction for our lives. In our passage earlier, we read verse 14, when Moses' father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he asked, what are you really accomplishing here? Why are you trying to do all this alone while everyone stands around you from morning till evening? You know, a long time ago, I was listening to a sermon by Adrian Rogers. He was a pastor in Memphis for many years, but he was from Florida, and he was telling a story where he had flown home to Florida. His hometown was a couple hours from the nearest airport in Tampa, so he flew into Tampa. He ran a car. He got on the road, and to his surprise, traffic was much lighter than it had ever been before, and the speed limit seemed like it was higher than it had ever been before, and so he was making great time, but before long, he realized the sights he saw were not familiar to him, So he stopped at a gas station to ask directions and came to find out he had gotten on the wrong road. He had gone in the wrong direction. He was in a situation where he was making great time going in the wrong direction. In our passage, Moses is making great time going in the wrong direction. Now, the book of Numbers tells us that the number of Israelite males who left Egypt was more than 600,000. In all likelihood, the Israelite community numbered between one and two million. That's a lot of people, and that's a lot of complaints for Moses to listen to. Now, if every single male has a complaint, that's 600,000, and Moses gives 10 minutes to every one of those complaints, he can literally hear complaints all day for 18 hours to get to the end of those 600,000 people would take him 555 days. Can you imagine being Moses going home after an 18-hour day, having heard 108 arguments settled, 108 matters, being really satisfied with all that you got done, only to wake up the next day and now there's 200 more complaints that you have to deal with. Moses was making great time going in the wrong direction. There are times in our lives where we're making great time going in the wrong direction. 
we're busy, we're stressed out, we're overwhelmed because we're doing all manner of things that we may not need to be doing. Some of you are feeling overrun, overwhelmed by life because you're trying to squeeze 10 pounds of life into what is a five-pound bag. Can I just tell you, what you need is not necessarily more capacity. You need direction for your life. It's time to stop trusting your own strength, your own ability. It's time to stop trusting your own wisdom and start trusting in God's plan. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. That's where Moses was at in this crossroads of life. That's where many of us are. Are at as well. I think about how Jesus' disciples were making great time going in the wrong direction. But when Jesus called them, he didn't give them more speed, more mental acuity, more capacity, more time, more energy. He gave them new direction. Jesus said, Follow me. And they had new direction. Jesus called out to his disciples, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. So we need to ask, how do we receive direction from the Lord? Where do we receive direction from the Lord? Let me give you four quick ways. We receive direction from the Lord, number one, by learning from mature Christians. We receive direction from the Lord by learning from mature Christians. That's what happened in Moses' life. Verse 19, now listen to me. This is Moses' father-in-law. Now listen to me, and let me give you a word of advice. May God be with you. You should continue to be the people's representative before God, bringing their disputes to him. He was getting direction from his father-in-law. His father-in-law was helping him know what was a priority and what was not a priority. Can I be honest with you? I was probably 27 years old having my first child when it occurred to me, I think maybe my mother knew a little bit about what she was doing or knew a little bit about life. And I have a father-in-law. I have a father-in-law like Moses had. I have a Jethro in my life. And I love him. He says some really funny stuff. One time he told me, I always knew I married Mrs. Wright. I just didn't know her first name was always. And all of his jokes go like that. They're they're, they're fantastic. He's got a great sense of humor, but but sometimes, like Jethro, he'll also come to me and say, hey, listen, what what you're doing isn't right. You're going to wear yourself out. You're going to run yourself out into the ground. We'll talk about raising our kids. We'll talk about life. We'll talk about balancing work. And it took me a while to realize that mature Christians are one of the most accessible and reliable sources of wisdom that a Christian can have. I've reached a point in my life where I seek out the wisdom and counsel of elders in my life. I've come to understand that's not a mark of weakness. That's a mark of wisdom and maturity. We receive direction from the Lord by learning from mature Christians, also by studying his word. As we look back at our passage, verse 20, teach them God's decrees. That was Jethro's advice to Moses. They don't need your wisdom, Moses. They don't need your point of view. Teach them God's decrees. That's what's really important. And let me just tell you, if you have God's word, if you have God's decrees, you are a step ahead. You are on a good foundation. Teach them God's decrees. Give them his instructions. Show them how to conduct their lives. What I have found is that living in a house with five people, myself included, there's always a lot of background noise. There's always a lot of distraction. And my wife and I, we always have to do a lot of repeating ourselves. Parents love that. They love saying the same thing, giving the same instruction over and over and over again. They, they really don't. You know, it's a little bit annoying when you've already given your kids directions and I want you to know that much of the direction you seek from the Lord he's already given in his word you're asking him to repeat himself and so sometimes we need to go to scripture and see what God has already said before we ask for a new answer or a new direction we receive direction from the Lord by studying his word also by hearing his voice as we pray Paul told the Philippians don't worry about anything instead Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. You know, many times our prayer lists, they really function as to-do lists, as though God were our personal assistant. Can't just tell you God's not our personal assistant. And he desires more than just our to-do list. And if you'll press into him in prayer and then pause and listen, 
you may actually hear him speak in that still, small voice. You may begin to have your eyes opened, your heart opened, how God intends to answer that prayer. And so we can hear his voice as we pray. We also receive direction from the Lord by getting involved in service. Paul told the Corinthians, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. I think, I think we receive direction from the Lord for our calling in his kingdom as we get involved in serving him. And let me tell you, everyone has a calling in the kingdom of God. If you are watching this, listening, if you are breathing and alive, God has a calling on your life. He has a purpose for your life. He has a plan for your life. And we get to better understand that as we practice serving him. You may get into serving in a ministry or on a team and come to find out it's not for you. It's way outside of your comfort zone. That's not your calling, and that's a win. Why? Because you knocked one that's not possible off of the list. You may get into a serving team. You may get into a life group and come to find out that's your sweet spot. You love those people. You love that activity. That's one of the ways that we can discern direction from the Lord is by getting our hands dirty and engaged in the work. So let me ask you, we, we talked about a lot, hearing from mature tr- Christians, studying God's word, hearing his voice as we pray and getting involved in service. W- w- where are you needing direction for your life and where are you getting it from we receive the help we need number one we receive the help we need by seeking god's direction for our lives number two by surrounding ourselves with others who can help us grow and this is where i need to tell you guys that christianity is not a solo sport it's not a solo game we need to surround ourselves with others who can help us grow now that was jethro's advice to moses moses you cannot do this alone Moses, you will run yourself into the ground. You will run these people into the ground. You must surround yourself with others who can help you grow and carry out the work of the ministry. He said, Moses, select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain. And I need to tell you, there's more to being a Christian than just believing certain things. It's not just about what we believe, it's about belonging. You see, accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior is also accepting your adoption into his family. It's accepting your citizenship into his kingdom. Belonging to the family of God is just as important as believing Jesus is who he says he is. And for many, belonging can actually come before believing. That's actually my story. I remember coming to church as a 19-year-old youngster. It felt like every word of the sermon was spoken right at me that day. And for months, I attended church. I heard the sermon. It, it, It impacted me. It challenged me. It felt like it was right at me. But if you want to know what drove me into the arms of Jesus, it was being around other Christians. Honestly, They were really aggravating to me because as someone who didn't know Jesus, they were full of all this peace and joy and hope. And to me, that was so foreign and it was so frustrating. And it was being in Christian community that validated the reality of the gospel I had been hearing for months. It was that Christian community. It was that belonging that came before believing. It was that belonging that actually drove me to believe that Jesus is, in fact, who he says that he is. Now, we need to remember that growth was never designed to be a one-man show, and it's important to surround ourselves with others. Let me tell you why. It's important to surround ourselves with others, number one, because we receive direction from one another. Jethro told Moses, Moses didn't conjure this on his own. This wasn't just a one-way channel between the Lord and Moses. Jethro said to Moses, if you follow this advice and if God commands you to do so, then you'll be able to endure the pressures and all these people will go home in peace. Isn't it interesting how often we ask for someone to give us an opinion about a situation and then we don't even follow through on their advice. We don't even follow it. And then we end up wrecked Wondering how it all went wrong. Well, you had good advice. You just didn't follow it. Isn't it frustrating how when you give someone advice and they go off and do the opposite, they get frustrated? You told them the right way to go. You told them what to do. And We can avoid these things. We can avoid these major pitfalls in our lives by listening to wisdom from others' successes and failures. That's why Paul said, keep putting into practice 
all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Listen, there's power, there's profitability, there's fruitfulness in receiving direction from one another. I want you to imagine for a moment your life is like a knife. Several months ago, my in-laws gave my kids some knives, <laughs> which sounds on the surface of it totally irresponsible. They get, gave them like whittling kits. My kids got really into whittling, not whittling wood. And, and so imagine you've got a knife that's it's quite like this. This is your life. You are a knife. And, you know, a, a knife is made for, for whittling wood or for cutting things. If you're a knife and all you ever hang around with is wood, you're going to end up dull in the long haul. You need people in your life who can act as a sharpening agent. Can I just tell you what happens when you try to use a knife that's too dull? Number one, it takes a lot more effort to cut. Number two, what you're trying to cut, what you're trying to carve, what you're trying to shape, it turns out a lot worse because you're using a dull blade. And number three, you run a higher risk of injury using a dull blade. If you're here, you're watching, you're listening, you're a Christian, you need to be around people who are going to sharpen you. The Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so one Christian sharpens another. That's one reason we need to be receiving direction from one another. Involving others in our lives allows us to receive direction. It also allows us to lighten our burdens. James 5.16, in the message translation says, make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. Elsewhere, Paul tells the Galatians, share each other's troubles and problems. There's a saying in Alcoholics Anonymous. It goes, you're only as sick as your secrets. Now, I'm not saying that when you go to a life group or participate in Christian fellowship that your first day there, first moment there, go ahead and open up, the, the, go ahead and open up your trunk and, and let everybody see all your secrets and let them spill out. I'm not saying you should do that. Listen, take some time, determine who's trustworthy, determine who you can connect with. What I am saying, though, is the alternative to getting into community, the alternative to being fully known by other people who value you and hold your best interests dear, the alternative to this is to be sick with your secrets. You don't need to be sick with secrets anymore. You don't need to live forever in bondage to whatever struggle, whatever stronghold is going into your life. One of the reasons we need to be in community with one another involving others in our lives is for them to lighten our burdens. There's this Swedish proverb. I don't know who said it. I don't know where it came from other than Sweden, but I love it. It says, shared joy is a double joy. Shared sorrow is a half sorrow. Some of you guys are carrying too much sorrow to do it alone. You can cut it in half by bringing someone else into your life to lighten that burden. Involving others in our lives also allows us to gain encouragement. Paul told the Corinthians a spiritual gift is given to each of us as a means of helping the entire church. You know, one of the spiritual gifts Paul talks about is the spiritual gift of encouragement. And we can provide ourselves temporary happy moments. You can do that all on your own, but encouragement requires others. I know this is going to come as a surprise to everyone watching. Sometimes I need a little bit of encouragement, confidence. So I'll look into the mirror, look deeply into my own eyes, uh, it, just enjoy how handsome my appearance is, and I'll say, Patrick, you're looking good today. You're looking sharp today. You are the bee's knees, my friend. You are the cat's pajamas. People like you. Now give me some sugar, Patrick, and I'll, I'll blow myself a little kiss. That is not true. <laughs> That is not true at all. And um, I, I, even if I did it, I don't think it would do much for me. I think I would know I was lying to myself the entire time. It's the nature of encouragement that it has to come from outside of you. It's the nature of encouragement that it has to be fed into you. And if you're not connected to a fellowship, to a community, especially a Christian community like a life group, 
you're cut off from encouragement. You're left to say strange things to yourself in the mirror. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, let us think of ways to motivate one another. Not let us stand in the mirror whispering sweet nothings in our own ear. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Can I just tell you, you can do this in a life group. When we talk about gaining encouragement, you can do that in a life group. When we talk about lightening our burdens, you can do that in a life group. When we talk about receiving direction from one another, you can do that in a life group. Also, involving others in our lives allows us to be reminded we are one part of a greater whole. We're just part of something bigger, stronger, greater than ourselves. Now, I have grown up in the age of video games. I grew up playing Super Mario, and I'll just tell you, when I was a kid, most of the games I played were single player. Uh, some of them had a multiplayer function, uh, but it was very rare to have a game that was multiplayer where you could play cooperatively. Today, a lot of games out there are multiplayer in nature. In fact, some video games are designed exclusively for online multiplayer. They don't even have single player features. Now, maybe you're a video gamer and you get that. Maybe you're an old school board gamer. Can you imagine the desperation of sitting down by yourself at a table and playing a good old fashioned game of risk? Or maybe checkers is your speed or chess. Hey, nothing is more fun than playing the game of life by yourself and retiring to millionaire estates, right? Have you ever tried playing Monopoly by yourself? Can I just tell you, there are things in life that are designed not to be solo sports, but to be multiplayer. Life is one of those things. Faith is one of those things. Video games, board games may be a decent analogy for faith community, but Paul used a different analogy for faith community. He talked about a body. Romans 12, 4 and 5, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We're all parts of his one body and each of us has a different work to do. And since we are all one body in Christ, we belong to each other and each of us needs all the others. Even in an eye-centered world with iPads, iPhones, etc. I have to acknowledge that I, I is a corporation, a corporation representing my skeletal system, my muscular system, my nervous system, and many other organs that work together, acting in concert as well as my soul. Any reference to I or me is actually a reference to the whole collection of my body, the whole collection of my life acting in concert. And just as any part of our body cannot operate without leaning on another, so too does our lives require others to truly be functional. You were made to be a part of a body that is a whole. Now, if I'm really honest, I'll tell you, I'm an extreme introvert. I'm most comfortable at home by myself, not having to share my space, not having to share my thoughts, not having to share my life, but I'm also a person, a person created in the image of God, a person designed for community and called by God. And while I'm most comfortable at home alone, I have to admit that I'm most capable and I'm actually most content when I'm part of a Christian community. Can I just tell you all the things we've talked about? You can be part of a greater whole in a life group. So let me ask you, what are the areas in your life that you need others to help share that load? We receive the help we need. Number one, we talked about seeking God's direction for our lives. Number two, we talked about surrounding ourselves with others who can help us grow. Number three, we receive the help we need by surrendering our will to the Lord. Let's go back to our passage, verse 24 through 26. Moses listened to his father-in-law. Listen, you have a choice. You can hear what I'm saying. You can respond because it's the word of the Lord, or you can ignore it. But you have a choice, just as Moses had. Moses' Moses's choice, he chose to listen to his father-in-law's advice. 
and followed his suggestions. He chose capable men from all over Israel and appointed them as leaders over the people. He put them in charge of groups of 1,000, 100, 50, and 10. These men were always available to solve the, the, the people's common disputes. They brought the major cases to Moses, but they took care of the smaller matters themselves. Now put yourself in Moses' shoes. Have you been handling your own business with millions of people and, and someone's told you what you're doing is not good and that's kind of like an offense to your pride a little bit. But can I just tell you, Moses listened to what his father-in-law said and followed his suggestions. And to succeed in taking our next step, we've got to surrender. We've got to surrender our attitudes, our ambitions, our desires, our comfort zone. We've got to surrender our will to the Lord. We've even got to surrender where we are. James said, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. What do I mean? What I mean is your life is at a certain, certain equilibrium right now. Your past, who you are, all of it has led you up to this point. And moving forward, especially following the Lord, is often intimidating. But you have to give up where you are in order to move further, in order to move forward, in order to move into the future that God has for you. It's like this. Here I am standing, and I know that God has a plan. He has a path for my life. I know he's got a destiny. I love him. I believe him. I'm trusting in him, but it's still intimidating giving up where I am. Where I am is what I know. Where I am feels secure, even if it's not great. Sometimes I think, better the devil I know than the devil I don't know. Let me encourage you. Trust the Lord. Be willing to surrender your heart and your future to him. Be willing to be bold, to step out of where you've been, to step into the plans, the future, the forward, the blessings, the anointing that he has for you. I need to tell you, many of those come through community, with community. Now I know you're watching with us online. Some of you guys, you may be local to New Orleans. You may be living less than a mile from where we're filming this right now. Some of you may live halfway across the world, but the Bible is the same in New Orleans. The Bible is the same as it is in Moscow. It's the same as it is in Sydney, Australia. It's the same as it is in Tehran, Iran. It's the same as it is in Beijing. It's the same as it is in Buenos Aires. The Bible is the same as it is in Zimbabwe. Listen, God is prompting us to be a people of community, to be part of the body he's called us to be a part of. So here's my encouragement to you. If you're watching this, you're not plugged into a life group or a small group church community, this is what I'd ask you to do. If you're local, let us know. We want to connect you to a life group. If you're from far away, let us know. We want to connect you to a life group. We have life groups that meet online. You can be a part of a community via Zoom. You can be a part of a community with people halfway around the world from you, but that's still being a part of a body. We want to help you get connected. You see, because at the end of the day, we've got to be who God's called us to be. And that involves seeking his direction for our lives. It involves surrounding ourselves with others that can help us grow. It involves surrendering our will to the Father. I hope that after today's service, you'll go to webcc.info and help us get you connected to a community of believers that can speak life into your very soul. So I want to go ahead and pray that God will give you the boldness and the peace to do just that. Lord Jesus, today we want to tell you how much we love you. Today we want to thank you for the word you've spoken into our lives through scripture. And so Lord Jesus, today we want to ask you for boldness. Help us to be bold because the reality is that where we've been is always going to feel more secure than where we're going. But Lord, our trust is not in ourselves, not in our own strength, not in our own wisdom, but it's in you. Lord, we want to be a part of this great grand thing you're doing in church. We want to be a part of this great grand body you've created for us to be a part of. So Lord, I pray for everyone watching, everyone listening to be filled with boldness, to be filled with courage, to be filled with peace 
as we step forward to follow you, as we begin plugging into a community, as we begin contributing to that life group, to that community. Lord, use it to give us direction. Use it to give us wisdom and counsel. Use it to bring us on the journey that you have planned for us a long, long time ago. Lord Jesus, today we give you all glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, that was super convicting and encouraging at the same time. I love the illustration Pastor Patrick used with the knife and, and the sharpening tool. And, you know, there was a study at Harvard that said you're the average of your five closest friends. I want you to think about that today as we close out our service. Where are your five closest friends heading? And we want to encourage you to join a life group. It's so easy to do that here at Celebration Online. If you want to get connected, go ahead and shoot us an email online at Celebration Church. Org. I would love to talk with you about how you can get connected to one of our online life groups. Once again, thank you so much for being here with us. I want to encourage you to share this service. We, you know and I know there are people in our lives that need to hear this message and be challenged with the things that we were encouraged with today. I hope you have a great week, and I can't wait to see you again next week here at Celebration Online.